Hello and welcome to episode 5 of the Shropshire Pilot Vlogcast. I'm Luke, a private helicopter pilot from Shropshire training towards the commercial licence and I'm documenting my experience without leaving anything out so you can see what it's really like. Along the way I'll be sharing things I wish I'd known before I started, so unless you're already crossing the Atlantic in a Dreamliner or flying offshore in an H175, I hope you'll find these videos useful. Today I'll be talking about how to pass the commercial exams and build your flight hours to the level required to start the commercial course, but just bear in mind that I'm sharing my personal experience, so always seek professional advice from your flight instructor or training organisation. If you're like me, with a full-time job or other responsibilities, I've got some essential tips to help you manage your time and get it all done. Let's do this! The process of getting a commercial pilot license isn't too dissimilar to the private pilot license, but the standard is much higher so you can expect it to be more difficult. Put simply, there are several theoretical knowledge exams and a practical skill test to pass, but as you're about to find out, it's a bit more complicated than that. First you need to decide which license to go for, the commercial pilot license, multi-pilot license or airline transport pilot license. If you want a career as an airline pilot, this is a fairly easy decision, as the majority of your commercial flying will eventually be in multi-engine aircraft over 5,700 kg max takeoff weight under instrument flight rules and multi-crew cooperation, and you'll need the highest level of license for this, which is the airline transport pilot license. You need to be at least 21 years old, and the license is frozen until you reach 1,500 flight hours, but you will have done all the training up front, and when it's unfrozen, you'll be granted full ATPL privileges. The multi-pilot license is designed to train pilots directly for co-pilot duties, and is tied to a specific airline and aircraft. It doesn't include PPL privileges, so you're unable to fly recreationally or as a single pilot, but you can start at the age of 18 and still act as co-pilot in multi-pilot multi-engine aircraft used for commercial air transport. The course can be completed with an approved training organisation that has an agreement with the airline, or occasionally directly with the airline itself through cadet programmes that use salary sacrifice to fund the cost of your training. Applications are competency-based, so not everyone will be accepted and the airline isn't legally obligated to guarantee a job, but it's arguably a more direct route to the flight deck and can be upgraded to ATPL at a later date. The commercial pilot license allows the holder to exercise the privileges of the PPL, act as pilot in command in commercial air transport of any single pilot aircraft and act as co-pilot subject to some restrictions. You can start at the age of 18 and for helicopter pilots the CPL is worth considering because we do most of our early commercial flying in single engine piston aircraft below 5700 kg max takeoff weight under visual flight rules and single pilot. You might need ATPL privileges at some point, but probably not until you move on to larger helicopters later in your career and you can upgrade the CPL when the time comes. Although the ATPL is the highest level of aircraft pilot license, the theoretical course includes instrument rating content, there's an extra exam to pass, you need to do multi-crew cooperation training, and in the skill test you need to demonstrate the ability to perform the relevant procedures and manoeuvres under instrument flight rules. Overall, this makes the ATPL more challenging than the CPL, but the downside is you'll need to sit most of the exams again if you decide to upgrade to ATPL, so the question is, do you do the extra work now or later? Another consideration for ATPL helicopter pilots is that you need to obtain an instrument rating and have a type entered on your license within 36 months of passing your theoretical knowledge exams, otherwise they'll expire and you'll need to sit 12 of them again. The problem is, a helicopter IR is prohibitively expensive compared to the fixed wing equivalent, so unless you can pay for it yourself or get lucky and find an employer who will, you could end up resitting exams anyway. Having said that, this scenario can be avoided with the ATPL H VFR, which allows you to add the IR at any time later on. UK pilots also need to decide which authority will issue the licence. Since Brexit, the UK Civil Aviation Authority has split from the European Union Aviation Safety Agency, and although most rules and regulations remain the same, you can't fly EU-registered aircraft with a UK CAA licence and vice versa. To make matters worse, some airlines employ UK citizens and operate EU-registered aircraft, so you need both, which means sitting the exams twice and paying the associated costs. Once you've chosen the licence, it's time to pick a training route, integrated or modular. 
Integrated means you sign up to a full-time set program, often paying a large sum up front and maybe even relocating so you can focus solely on the training. Modular is the opposite of this. You go at your own pace so you can fit the training in around your other commitments. Integrated is typically quicker but more strict and modular is more relaxed but can take longer. If you're interested in an integrated course here in the UK, there are a few providers to choose from, including Skybourne Airline Academy, L3 Harris Commercial Aviation, Leading Edge Aviation and Stapleford Flight Centre. After one to two years of intensive training at a cost of around £100,000, you'll be a fully qualified commercial pilot ready to work. Just be cautious paying such a large sum of money up front because it's not protected and the recent closure of well-known flight schools Tayside Aviation and FTA Global has left student pilots with significant financial losses. You could also apply for a scholarship through which your flight training is either partially or even fully funded, but these are rare and extremely competitive. Flight Training News is a good source for current scholarships, but a quick Google search will also point you in the right direction. With the modular route, you pay as you go, so there's less risk of losing money, but you have to do more work yourself. The first step is to find a training provider to help you study for the theoretical knowledge exams, and there are a few to choose from, but I'll be talking about Bristol Ground School, Cats Aviation Training School, and Caledonian Advanced Pilot Training. Each of them offer a variety of courses, mostly for distance learning, and divide the subjects into three modules like this. Module 1, Instrumentation, General Navigation, Meteorology and Human Performance and Limitations. Module 2, Radio Navigation, Airframe and Systems, Electrics, Power Plant and Emergency Equipment, Air Law, Flight Planning and Flight Monitoring and Communications. And Module 3, Operational Procedures, Principles of Flight, Performance and Mass and Balance. You may have already heard of Bristol Ground School as they're a popular choice and have a high pass rate. Their learning materials are excellent and they include five days of tuition per module at £2,580 for the ATPL course. Cats Aviation Training School also provide high quality learning materials with four days of tuition per module at £1,499 for the ATPL course. However, helicopter pilots have to pay an additional £1,400, which actually makes it more expensive than Bristol Ground School. If you're a self-disciplined ATPLA student looking to save money, Cats Aviation Training School might be a better option and they also occasionally offer £500 off on social media. Caledonian Advanced Pilot Training offer the least expensive course at £495 and charge £150 for consolidation days as and when you need them. For ATPL, 65 hours or 8 days is the legal requirement, so the total cost would be £1,695, but for CPL it's 25 hours or 3 days, so that makes it £945. The head of training, Phil Croucher, is the author of several books including Private Helicopter Pilot Studies, which I recommended for the PPL exams and the commercial learning materials are of the same high standard. His straight-talking, no-nonsense approach is also a refreshing change from the sales tactics of the other training providers. All three have their own question banks to prepare you for the exams, but to get as much exposure as possible, it's wise to have at least one other source of questions. If you don't choose to study with Bristol Ground School, you can still buy access to their question bank, and several other companies offer the same, but Aviation Exam, ATPL Questions and ATPL On Track are among the best. Subscription terms range from 30 days to one year, and as an example, Bristol Ground School charge £160 for a year. When you're ready to take the exams, you need to book them through the CAA portal at a cost of £82 per exam. There are date ranges throughout the year called sittings, during which you take the exams in sessions and you need to attend a venue in person. Bristol Ground School have their own venue which is open to all students, but there are others at Gatwick, Luton, Ayrshire, Gloucestershire Airport, Russyth and Oxford Airport. So, how do you give yourself the best chance of passing the commercial exams first time? ATPL knowledge has been assessed as level 5 study, equivalent to the second year of a university degree course, and you should expect it to be a substantial academic challenge. Not only do you need to carefully study and really understand the material, but also know how to analyse the language and format of the questions. Don't rely on classroom sessions to fully prepare you for the exams, you need to do the work yourself. Before you start studying, there are some steps you should take in preparation. Your training provider will likely give you study materials in an on-screen format, but if you prefer physical copies, you can usually buy them at an additional cost and there are a number of commercial books you may find helpful. 
You'll also need the Jefferson General Student Pilot Route Manual, which contains all the maps and charts needed for the course and exams, but make sure you get the most recent edition as it was amended when the EASA question bank was updated in 2018. If you didn't buy a Puli CRP5 during your PPL, you'll need one now, or a similar commercial alternative like the Jeppesen CR3, as well as an approved scientific calculator like the Casio FX85 or Sharp ELW531. You can also take a clear plastic ruler, protractor, compass, but not the magnetic kind, and fine tip marker into the exams, so you might want to get these if you don't already have them. Just don't take a pencil case because for some reason they're prohibited. Before diving into your first subject, it's a good idea to brush up on basic maths and physics, and some training providers will include this as pre-study. You don't need to be a genius, but it could be difficult to relearn these at the same time as the exam subjects, and a quick refresher will help you out later on. When you've got everything you need and signed up to a course, it's time to study. And if you've been a student in the recent past, you probably already know what works for you. But if it's been a while, it can take some figuring out. So here are some essential tips to help you make the most of your time. For the ATPL, there are almost 700 questions to be answered in just over 18 hours. And this requires a quick and methodical pace, so you should apply that mindset to your study. Start by finding a location without distractions where you can focus and aim to get into a routine. Generally speaking, the brain works most effectively at the start of the day and in short bursts, so try morning study sessions of 45 minutes with short breaks of around 10 minutes in between. That's not to say you can't study in the afternoons and evenings, but after a day's work it might not sink in as easily. The key is to be consistent so the knowledge stays in your memory, and you might find it useful to create a weekly schedule with study time allocated each day. You should also alternate subjects so they all progress at a similar rate. For example, if your first module is instrumentation, general navigation, meteorology and human factors, you'll sit those exams together, so try not to get stuck on one subject at the expense of the others. As you progress, make notes or flashcards and write down anything you're unsure about so you can either ask your training provider or bring it up at the pre-exam brush-up days. It's important to develop weak areas, but focusing too much on them is a quick way of fueling negativity, so don't beat yourself up too much and remember to recognize your strengths and successes. Online groups like the Professional Pilots Rumor Network are a good source of support, and it's also helpful to keep in touch with your fellow students and other pilots. You're obviously going to feel stressed, but there are several ways you can manage it. Look after yourself by eating regularly to keep blood sugar levels up, not drinking too much tea, coffee or alcohol, and taking regular exercise as this burns stress chemicals like adrenaline and releases endorphins. If you just can't get out of your own head, try refocusing your mind by enjoying a hobby, meditating or simply focusing on your breathing. It's not going to be easy, but lots of pilots have been through this before and you can do it too, so don't lose sight of your goal and imagine what it'll feel like when you reach it. As well as studying for and passing the commercial exams, you need to build your flight hours to the required amount to start the commercial flying course. For example, to start a modular CPL H course, you need 155 hours, including 50 hours as PIC, of which 10 hours must be cross country. However, there are different criteria for the other licenses, so check with your training organization or on the CAA website. It's easy to see our building as just another checklist item on the way to flying commercially, but it's probably the only opportunity you'll get to fly for yourself and you should make the most of that freedom. Take friends and family with you and enjoy the experience, but also challenge yourself to keep developing your skills. An occasional flight with an instructor is also a good idea to practice more complex maneuvers and emergency procedures, and you may also want to add a type rating to your license, for example a Cessna 172 or Robinson R44, which requires differences training with an instructor and a proficiency check with an examiner. Type ratings entered onto your license typically have a one-year expiry and can be renewed after they've expired or revalidated up to three months beforehand. A proficiency check is basically a skill test without the navigation section, and if you pass, the examiner will endorse your rating with a new expiry date by signing the relevant section of your license and entering the new date. Our building is an expensive part of your flight training, but there are ways to reduce costs. It's likely that your fellow students would be open to the idea of cost sharing, where you equally divide the piloting duties and costs of the flight, including the higher fee, fuel, oil, landing fees, and so on. 
You can also cost share with passengers, but be very careful to follow the guidance on the CAA website and in CAP 1589, as flights conducted by a PPL holder must not be commercial in any way. Companies like Wingly actually allow pilots to advertise their cost-sharing flights to passengers, and although it's legal, some consider it controversial. You can also reduce costs by registering for value-added tax, which allows you to claim VAT refunds on goods and services. If your career path leads you to become a self-employed sole trader, you will likely be eligible to make what are referred to as taxable supplies, which is a term for supplying goods and services on which VAT can be charged. Once you've registered, you need to submit a VAT return to HM Revenue and Customs every three months to claim your refunds, but you also need to show the VAT you've charged your customers. For more information, refer to VAT Notice 700, and if in doubt, you can always ask a professional accountant. That's it for today's episode, but if you have any questions, just leave a comment or contact me on Instagram or TikTok. If you're about to start your commercial exams, good luck and see you on the other side. Have a great day and happy flying.